Welcome to the Snake's Paw. Today we begin our new series, Marjorie and Houdini. This is part one, an informal gathering. John, will you bring that thing into tune? Thank you. Finally. <clears throat> Who's there? Malcolm Bird. I have an invitation. Mr. Bird, welcome. We sent the servants out for the night. I'll take your coat. Thank you, sir. You'll be Dr. Crandon? That's right. Huh. I've heard such a lot about your experiments. It's an honor to be included. I'm sure I've held you up. Should we get things started? In a moment. First, I'd like to... John? John? Will you go to your room? My wife's son. He gets absorbed in his radio, built it himself, very bright. Sir Arthur wrote you quite a recommendation. He tells me you're a journalist? Yes. And one who doesn't say no if Arthur Conan Doyle tells him there's a story to be had. Indeed. And he's sending you here as a Sherlock Holmes? Not at all. If anything, I'm a Watson. Here to observe and write it all down for posterity. And your publication? Is it a journal or a... magazine? We're called Scientific American. I would call us a journal disguised as a magazine. A layman's gateway to the frontiers of science. And from what I'm told, the frontiers of science are here in this house. We cover research like yours regularly. Very good. Please forgive my caution. I've found the newspapers far from trustworthy when it comes to our work. Even my fellow physicians. I had high hopes when I began to share my experiments, but most of them have been openly hostile. They were the same to Galileo. Hmm. I don't expect to be a Galileo. But in 40 years in the medical profession, I've seen enough people die on an operating table. Well, it seems only right to turn our minds to bigger questions. Bigger discoveries. Before we go up, my wife, as you know, plays a central role. She knows we have a guest, but I haven't mentioned your professional interest. I'd rather not see her distracted. I'll introduce you properly afterward. Understood. I'll be undercover. And if it's a story you want, you're in the right place. I believe we're on the cusp of a breakthrough, and today might be the day. Here we are. Please excuse me while I go check on my wife. We should be ready to begin very soon. I've heard some people do these in the nude. <laughs> you don't say. Have you ever been to one like that out of Florence? Oh, stop. Joseph's family thinks I'm a regular libertine. Hello. Good evening. You're new to us, aren't you? I'm Florence Atherton. This is my nephew, Joseph. Hello. And his friend, Miss Ruth Rainier. How do you do? Malcolm Bird. Are you a friend of the Crandons? A friend of a friend. I haven't even met Mrs. Crandon yet. Joseph and Ruth are here for the first time, too. Is this your first seance, Mr. Bird? Oh, no. I've attended quite a few. I can assure you that no one measures up to the Crandons. I lost my little daughter Mary to scarlet fever years ago. <sighs> I went to any number of mediums who put on a baby voice and did the tearful reunion bit, cooing and telling me how much they missed me. And then I came here. As we sat around the table, her spirit entered into it, and there's no other way to put it. We played. It sounds ridiculous, but we played tag like we used to up and down the hallway. <laughs> you play tag with a table? <laughs> <laughs> I told you. Aunt Florence has some <laughs> novel ideas. <laughs> you two can poke fun, but you'll see. <clears throat> I'm sure Mr. Bird would agree that a good seance helps put life in perspective. Take Mina and Leroy. Would you believe, Mr. Bird, that just a few months ago their marriage seemed to be on the rocks? Ah, uh, no. Ah, uh, yes. Before they contacted Walter, it looked like she might go the way of his other two wives. But their experiments brought them closer than ever. Leroy was the one who first took an interest. I mean, he's a scientist, after all. 
And then Mina gave it a try for his sake, and now she's done such remarkable... Speaking of the <gasps> devil. Oh, Mina, goodness. How are you? Oh, just felt my ears itching. We were just gossiping with the new visitor. This is my nephew Joseph and his friend Ruth. Hello. And you must be our other guest. I'm Mina Crandon. Very pleased to meet you. Mina, time to begin. And I didn't even have a chance to try the cheese platter. Oh, well, let's take our seats. Does it matter where I sit? Wherever you like. It helps if you sit by someone familiar. Here, by me. Since I don't know anyone, may I take the hostess's hand? You're more than welcome. Quiet, everyone. Before we begin, I would like to review our rules. As you may know, these phenomena only occur in darkness, so we'll keep all the lights off except for a small red lamp. The arrangement of the people seems to be important, so please stay seated, even if something catches you off guard. If we're able to make contact, speak one at a time. If we get answers, they will come in code. One for no, two for don't know, three for yes. Uh, anything else, Mina? Welcome, everyone. All I want to say is be at ease. The process is only a formality. Is everyone ready? Ready. Ready. Yes. Okay. The lights, please. The red lamp, for now. Join hands with your neighbor. Let them rest on the tabletop. You will feel the table move. Don't let it disturb you. And don't break contact with the others. Take deep and even breaths. Walter, can you feel us? Would you like to spend some time together? What is that? The Victrola needle. He likes to drag it across the record. He's seeing if he likes the song. <laughs> Can't resist a little theme music. <laughs> For those who have not met him, I would like to introduce you to my brother, Walter. Have you been busy since our last chat? <gasps> <laughs> Still loafing around like you did when you were alive? <laughs> we have several new people with us tonight. I guess you already know who they are. They're eager to talk and hear news from others on your side. Can we ask you some questions? <laughs> oh, Walter. Florence, would you like to start? Hello, Walter. Have you missed me? Oh, <laughs> Walter, you dreadful flirt. You know I'm ticklish there. <clears throat> now, what was I? Oh, oh, yes. Last week, Aunt Mare visited me in a dream, and I just wanted to say that it was very thoughtful of her. And tell Albert to expect Maxime soon. It should only be a few days now. Would your nephew like to ask Walter anything? I wouldn't know what to ask. You can think about it for a moment. You're also here for the first time. What's your name? Ruth. Should I ask him about... Dead folks? That kind of thing? Ask him anything you like. Has he seen my Uncle Robert around? What about my sweetheart, Tucker, who died in the war? I guess he doesn't get out much. What about... What about Sicily? Oh. You can ask a question. Oh. Right. Is she... Is she lonely there? 
Does she miss me? Is that a silly thing to ask? One question at a time. Does she miss me? <gasps> Sicily. Tell her I miss her. I'm sorry. I, I didn't... No need to apologize. I have so much to ask her. I don't know where to... <sighs> In due time. First contact is often overwhelming. Sit with it. Open yourself up to her presence. Joseph? Anyone you would like to contact? No. Mr. Bird? Is Walter able to perform physical phenomena, aside from the music and the knocking? Oh, Walter is quite athletic for a spirit. Can you lift the table for us, Walter? Show off those ethereal muscles of yours? <gasps> Joseph, can you feel that? Do you think he could move my watch through the air? Certainly. A watch is much lighter than a table. Only, I'm not sure I can remove it without breaking the circle. Walter can take care of that. Why, so he can. Anything else you'd like to see? No, that's plenty. Thank you for indulging me. I have a question, if that's all right. Oh, go ahead. What's it like over there? That's the million-dollar question. You'll have to rephrase it so he can answer yes or no. Miss Rainier, that is what we've been trying to ask Walter all along. Unfortunately, our current system has its limitations. It would be nice to chat with Walter man-to-man, wouldn't it, Mina? He could tell us so much. We all know you're capable. I'm not sure that tonight, with so many strangers here... How can we really learn anything with Walter tapping away like some miner trapped underground? This is what we've been working toward for months. Why hold back now? Walter, don't you want to speak freely? I don't know if I'm ready, dear. Little sister will do as big brother says. Mine on my hand. Turn off the light. Complete darkness. I'm very close now. God damn. That feels good. I've wanted to say goddamn for you, so oh. screw off. You wanted Walter. Here he is. We should celebrate. How about a song? Should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? You stiffs make me look hale and hearty. Where's your spirit? <laughs> Should old acquaintance be forgot and days of old lang syne? That's better. All together for the chorus now. For old lang syne, my dear, for old lang syne, we'll drink a cup of kindness yet for old lang syne. God damn. Ah, like a breath of fresh air. Oh, Walter, we can really hear you. That's because I'm talking, Florence. That's how talking works. Walter, tell Cicely I'm sorry if I'd have known about all this sooner. Walter, can you bring Mary back to play again? Quiet. Keep our research in mind. Sorry, Leroy. It's just so... Of course. Walter, as you know, we'd like to understand what it's like over there. Now that we can talk, 
Tell us. I'm not sure I could describe it to you if I tried. You have to at least try. Why else do we do this? And here I was, thinking you enjoyed my company. What is it like over there? What do you see? What do you hear? Oh, you know, wings, halos, harps, guy with a big white beard, screams of torment from somewhere down below. We're serious, Walter. Brother-in-law, have you ever tried describing a color to someone who was born blind? Well, I could... It's not all different. Some of the old world is still there. I'm kind of still at the spot where I died. I can see the top. How did you die? Little sister didn't mention that. Out of consideration for everyone's comfort, we haven't broached... Yeah, well, you didn't ask a comfortable question. What's your name, little lady? Ruth? Ruth. You know, I used to do a bit of this table tipping thing myself. Never had a clue how I did it, but when me and the boys were out for drinks, I would make the table rock back and forth. Mine always said it was bullshit, but I guess she came around. So one night, me and the boys are out on the job. We just finished unloading a boxcar, and the train is on its way out, so we're taking a breather. And one of them brings up the table tipping thing, says, How come it only works when we can't see your legs? And he dares me to do it right there out in the open. So I pick one of the crates we just pulled from the train, focus on it. And then there's this creaking sound and all the boys are running. And the next thing I know, the whole damn train is coming down and it falls. Just so the top half of me is poking out from under it. So my boy comes over and asks if I can hear him. And you know what I say. What? Guess that didn't count, huh? Since you can't see my legs. That's not quite how I heard the story told, Walter. Well, brother-in-law, much as I appreciate the input of an armchair coroner, I've got the whole scene laid out before me as we speak, so I'm gonna go with my flattened guts on this one. That's what you see? I mean, you don't have to sound like that about it. It's not like... I'm not in myself. I can just look one way and kind of see myself lying under the... And, and out in another direction. It's like, imagine if the whole thing had happened on the edge of this cliff that's slowly crumbling and, and I'm standing near the edge looking off and it's all clouds. Even looking down. It's only clear far enough to know it goes down a long, long way. But it's probably an incredible view out past that. Might be a little scary for some folks, but for me, it's bracing. And there's all of you. It's like, if I look just the right way and squint, it's like there's a hole in something and you're on the other side. I can hear you, but it's like a bad telephone connection. And I can see you. Some of you more than others. The things around you I can barely see at all. But I still move them somehow or other, so I guess I still got it. What about the others? Who do you mean? Our family. Our friends over there. Oh, them. There are people everywhere. We're not side by side, but it's like we're tied together somehow. And when you ask me about someone, I feel a tug and there they are. That much I can say, but the rest of it... I'll need time. I apologize, Walter, if I... It's only... We're so eager to learn more. Sure, sure, so you've said. And maybe we can help you find the words. We can ask questions. We can narrow things down. Of course. Things will be so much easier than before. Yes. Things will be easier now. But right now, I... I... I believe I've done all I can. Yes. Rest, Walter. We'll see you again soon. Everybody, a short night, but momentous. And now, Mina will need to rest. May we have the light? 
Take a moment to adjust your eyes and I'll see you out. Please feel free to linger downstairs and talk, but we must give Mina some space. Is everyone leaving? We can still... Mina, rest. You've done very well. This way, everyone. Would you all mind if I stayed a moment to ask Mrs. Crandon a question? I don't... Of course, Joseph. Take all the time you need. All right. But keep your voice low. She needs to recover. We'll wait downstairs. Now, Leroy, tell me all about how things are at the hospital. Hey, Joey, can we... Mrs. Crandon? Yes, Joseph? What is it? Why does it all have to happen in the dark? I honestly don't know. I wish I did. There's a lot I can't explain. May I? Sir, you know that photographs can only be developed in the dark, don't you? Light is something we understand poorly, but there's no question it has an effect on all kinds of... I have a theory, too. Oh, yes? Don't you think it might be because it's all fake? Joey! Are you saying you have proof of fraud? Of course not. It was in the dark, so there isn't... Yes, sir. You asked a question about darkness. Now you're getting an answer. Unless you weren't interested in answers to begin with. I don't know how she's doing. I just know my aunt has been useless since she started coming here. You're getting awfully emotional, sir. Joey. Joey! I said the fake names like you asked and she knew. There's no way she could have known about Sicily. Ruth! There's no reasoning with you people. Mrs. Crandon, I'm sorry. I had no idea. It's not your fault. Will you come back and visit us next week? I... Thank you. Good night. And then there were two. Maybe now we can finish introducing ourselves. I'm Mina Crandon. Malcolm Bird. Malcolm Bird. Not a typical name for a knight that slays the dragon. Can I call you Lancelot? I, uh... How about tonight, Mr. Bird? Quite a leap forward, eh? Uh, you mentioned you were anticipating a breakthrough. You were referring to verbal communication? Of course. Until now, I've been able to get nothing out of him but raps on the table. I may do by suggesting the code, but now this! All in one night! Of course. I must say, though, spirit voices, as popular as they may be are a shade outside the purview of my work. I focus on physical phenomena, psychokinesis. Be that as it may, surely what you've seen tonight is something remarkable. Absolutely, very compelling. But spirit voices are quite common. More common than not. I don't mean to say anything about them, except that they're the easiest phenomenon to fake and the hardest one to prove. You mean you actually prefer all that knocking on tables? And the levitation of tables, which I think I witnessed twice tonight? I could only say once, for sure. But surely, if we're so lucky as to speak to the dead, those matters are a bit trivial. Oh, sir, I share your eagerness to get to the bottom of it all. But the words of the spirits, if they are spirits, are like any other words. They're only as good as the people speaking them. And we have no way to know for sure if what they say is true, or even if they are who they claim to be. (laughs) What are you giggling about, Mina? It's just that Walter was an awful prankster, and he would get a laugh out of convincing us the afterlife was, I don't know, the inside of a giant peanut butter sandwich or something. There you have it. No more reason to trust the dead than the living. The thing about the physical phenomena is that we can measure them. If what we measure matches up with what the spirits say, all the better. But if not, we have to let go of what they tell us, however alluring it may be. I suppose then that you find our situation here completely uninteresting. Not at all. Full levitation of a table is nothing to laugh at. Partial levitation, maybe. And that business with my watch. It all forms an excellent basis for starting our investigation. Our investigation? Yes. Mr. Bird here is a psychical investigator who will be... Yes, dear. I gathered as much on the basis of my not being stupid, but... Someone has to know what we're discovering here apart from the Florences of the world. The decision is made. Leroy Crandon? I'm on my way. Is everything all right? Normal as can be. Just another emergency surgery. Mr. Bird, this is what our work is for. In 20 minutes, I'll be trying to save someone's life. And if I can't, I'll have to face their family. Do you know what we tell them? We tell them dying is like falling asleep. Because we don't know any better. But Walter can tell us. And if he's a liar, it just means a little more work to get the truth out of him. And we may learn that things are better there. If I can tell the families of my patients that their departed loved ones are to be envied and not grieved, that will be worth the effort. 
So, you are welcome to observe our work and conduct your tests, but I'll be continuing my work too. Mina, see that Mr. Bird is comfortable. In that case, Mr. Bird, let me invite you to stay with us. Mina, he already has a hotel. If he's investigating us, he's investigating our house. He'll need to see who comes and goes, get to know the place, search it up and down. What about it, Mr. Bird? Are you willing to be our captive? Mina, I have to go. Yes, don't be late, dear. I'll take care of everything. It seems like Dr. Crandon may not be eager for guests. Oh, don't be fooled. You heard the kind of things he sees at work. He's hardly fit for laughing and joking and small talk after a day of that. We here at home are used to it. We make sure he has everything he wants and then we give him his space. You'll get used to it too. So tell me about this investigation of yours. Of course. My card. Scientific American? The magazine? You know it. I've heard of it. And if I accept this card as being genuine, then it seems you're the editor. An editor. I was brought on to cover psychical research. With all the public interest, we really had no choice but to start covering it. And what is it you're trying to prove? Physical phenomena are what we're investigating now. And as part of our investigation, we're offering an award. $2,500 for anyone who can demonstrate measurable psychic phenomena to the satisfaction of a majority of our prize committee. And has anyone given you... Satisfaction? I'm sorry? Ah, no, not yet. But I chalk that up to the sort of people we've seen. The cash prize is unfortunately necessary. The public loves a contest. But it also attracts the sort of frauds who are in it for the money. Exposing them helps us all. And given Dr. Crandon's position in the world, I feel confident a little money won't distract us from what really matters. Which is? Well... Part of our job at Scientific American is to get a head start on posterity. When a breakthrough comes along, we want to make sure the world knows who to thank. I don't know how I feel about being thanked all the time. I like to be able to leave the house in peace. Live not for yourself. Do it for the good of the world. Think where the rest of us would be if Galileo had kept his knowledge up there in his tower. My history may be shaky, but I don't seem to remember Galileo's story having a happy ending. I know you're just doing your job, but I didn't go looking for any of this. If Dr. Crandon hadn't insisted that we give this seance business a try, I would have gone to my grave thinking it was all nonsense. But he did insist, and he's gotten so much out of the work, so I do it for him. For myself, all I want is a quiet, simple life with room to have some fun. And all this attention sounds like quite the opposite. In that case, we can leave your name out of it. We'll call you something else. Marjorie. Mystical enough to catch the eye, but still respectable. What do you think? Mystical, but respectable. Is that how you think of me, Birdie? Birdie? What happened to Lancelot? Now that I know you, you're much more of a Birdie. Do you like Birdies? I do. And I love when one lands in my hand. Are you hungry, Birdie? Nothing makes me hungrier than levitating tables, and we have a lot more than a cheese plate downstairs. How about an after-dinner snack, and you can tell me more about your committee? Just a few men of different specialties. Myself, a journalist, one a scientist, one a stage magician. With so many con men clouding your field, no one better than a con man to expose them, right? Listen, can you believe that? John's been listening to his radio all night. Come by his room quietly, Who no chain or lock can hold? The jailbreaker, Harry Houdini. Houdini presents a combined program of wondrous magic, his most famous escapes, and in a segment never before seen by the public, the tales of his first-hand experience exposing spiritualists and mediums, those miracle mongers whose tricks have escaped every other eye. And the highlight event, a truly death-defying stunt, escape from a live burial under multiple tons of sand. Failure means death. Will he liberate himself? That was Marjorie and Houdini, part one. An Informal Gathering, written by Matthew Morris and Andrew Ferrier with help from Jack Townsend. You heard the voices of John Angelo Casaro, Andrew Ferrier, High Priest Roby, Matthew Morris, 
Ann Mammoth, Helen Jacks, and Tyler DeQuilla. We had recording help from James Lanius and mastering and sound design from Zach Lanius. You can find us online at thesnakespaw.com with links to all our various platforms, and you can also support the show at ko-fi.com slash thesnakespaw. We'll be back with the next installment in a week.